Ahí, ahí, ¿el audio está bien? Uno, dos, uno, dos. Muy bien. Entonces, el, la idea es, en la medida de las posibilidades, les vamos a entregar las presentaciones antes de la clase. Eh, pero eh, ustedes ya saben que la presentación también está en línea. Entonces, el día que no les toque Hands Out, eh, le pueden conectarse con el celular, a internet, y están en la página ya eh, montados. Eh, recuerden entonces, hoy tenemos un horario especial. Mm, es decir, empezamos a las 2, pero mañana a las 2 es el examen y a las 2 y media comenzamos. Ok. Uh, so, Mr. Hayes. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Yes. Ah, last. Uh, si pueden preguntar al micrófono mejor. Te lo voy a dar entre ustedes. Lo voy a dar con alguien que de pronto no pregunte nada durante de, 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 de la clase. <laughs> Maybe I, maybe you should just have this one. I just might be. No. <laughs> right. yeah. um, thanks for coming. It's great. Uh, my my name is Alan Hayes, as you've just heard. And and uh, before I talk about the astrochemistry and sciencey things, I'll talk about myself. And I'll try and give the impression about how amazing the life of the scientist is, traveling around the world and uh, living in many places. And like that's the best part of the job. That's also the worst part of the job because you can never get to live anywhere for very long. Like it's a, it's a so, so let me just go through this quickly to say a little bit about who I am. Um, and that I'm, I'm actually from, not from the Holland or Pais Bajos. Pais Bajos. I'm, I'm from New Zealand actually originally. And that, that's a picture of New Zealand. Uh, I, I grew up in Auckland, and I even grew up scientifically in Auckland, and that my first two degrees, the degree and the master's degree, were there. And my speciality at that time wasn't astronomy or chemistry. It was uh, in a physics department, but it was uh, weather prediction. So that's actually the anticyclone, weather. So that's, that's, that was kind of interesting. And my project is, is related a little bit. At that time, my master's project. The idea was that in Auckland is like a bit of land. Not with that pen. This is my hometown of Auckland. With the ocean on both sides. And the idea was that during the day, there's a lot of sun. I mean, not like here, but some. And then this temperature becomes quite high compared to the temperature over the water. And you have thermodynamic effects with the gas here the density goes down, so there's kind of a flowing of air upwards as the density as the gas expands with the temperature. That kind of creates a circulation from the ocean back to the land. You see, every day you get this breeze from the, from the sea. And it's good because otherwise it would be too hot. And so the study I was doing was studying this breeze. But the thing that was interesting about it was that it wasn't trying to predict how strong it would be or what time it would start during the day. But it was saying, if you don't know this temperature exactly, you know, it's plus or minus 15 degrees in the morning. You don't, you don't know this temperature exactly either. In fact, you don't know anything. You don't even know exactly how many clouds there are. So the strength of this wind might be during the day. How strong is this breeze? It might start off low and then increase during the day. But if your initial condition of the temperature was wrong, maybe it would increase faster during the day. Maybe it would increase slower. So you actually end up with kind of a, an area where the weather might possibly be. And because if you, if you run a numerical model, which you might have done yourself, you always end up with a really nice graph at the end, which might be completely wrong. Like you really have no idea if that's, it always looks good. In the lab, you always have really noisy kind of data, but at least you know it's the real universe, so it's right in the middle. So this kind of thing about whether or not it's right or not, how accurate it is, is really important. And that's true as well in, in I guess, all of astronomy, but definitely astrochemistry, because you deal with so many physical processes, so many assumptions, that if you're not asking this question all the time, then you're getting an answer, but you're not really interpreting it right. So that's, uh, that was interesting. Then I left Auckland and I went to Australia, which is New Zealand's big brother. Um, and what I did there is I actually studied not numerical weather modeling, but I studied quantum mechanics. So that was like a complete change for me. And uh, let me ask you something here. Uh, get rid of this. Where, where in Australia? Uh, in uh, the ACT. The, capital city of Canberra, which is also the big, well, one of the bigger places for astronomy as well, actually. Like you, you went to us, something to that. Uh, 
Was, was, was it in Canberra or uh, Melbourne? Yeah. Okay, well, well so the, this is like the, uh, the more out of the way place. In fact, this, this hill here is covered in kangaroos, like hundreds. And that's right beside my house. It's right beside the middle of the city. It's pretty, basically a giant zoo, actually. But while I was there, I was studying quantum mechanics. And particularly, I was studying one molecule, which is a, um, the molecular nitrogen making up the atmosphere. Uh, is it called a? Hey, eh? nitrogen. Yeah, in, in uh, Spanish. Uh, I loved it. Okay. Good. I now know that. And so it's it's just two atoms stuck together. And as as it's shown there, it's got the three lines. And the question is, who knows what those three lines symbolize? It's kind of chemistry, but physicists will cover that maybe at some point in their life. So if this is the nitrogen molecule drawn badly, that's a better one. The three lines between the atoms. Electronic things. Electronic things, exactly, yeah. And so electrons. electrons, yeah. In fact, it's, it's the pairs of electrons that are, that are binding. The important thing to remember about nitrogen is that it has so many electrons which are not really in a closed shell of, its, of the atom. And so those electrons are free to bind in the molecule. And so this three lines mean there's three electrons, or three pairs of electrons, binding the, the molecule together. Just a thought to ask. Uh, then I, I left Australia after the PhD and moved to Amsterdam, which is, a, that's probably so far the coolest place I've ever lived. Um, not because of the stereotypes you might be thinking of, <laughs> because it's actually just very cool. Like it's very chilled out, good population, beautiful, good lifestyle, terrible weather. Uh, eternal eternal uh, late autumn might be if the Medellin is eternal spring. I don't know. And, uh, and so there I was also studying molecules, but now I was doing the, a little bit more work in, in the laboratory, specifically at, at, at synchrotrons. Because the thing I was interested in about with nitrogen was the way that it interacts with ultraviolet light. So that's the highly chemically reactive, high in the atmosphere, energetic photon. And so there I was working, you look, using a, 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 a synchrotron, is a, a facility in France that you can apply the time and do experiments. And the idea was to have generate enough ultraviolet light that you could shine it on molecular nitrogen, and then you just break the atoms apart and end up with two atoms. And uh, so that was kind of the experimental part of what I was doing in my PhD, which was more theoretical. Okay, then, then I left there, and I went to, really briefly, for a short uh, postdoc in, in America, at, in, in Wellesley College near Boston. And, and I, I put that in for two reasons. It was only for six months, so it wasn't very long. It's interesting because if you ever go to Boston, which you might one day, go to Wellesley because it's, it's, like, a, it's like the richest place I've ever been. Like, the houses are... I mean, it's amazing. Like, it really is like a theme park of America, I think. So go out of town if you're in Boston to see the rich place as well. <laughs> and there I, I, I switched molecule for a while. This is uh, N2, uh, I thought there. And the other next one was carbon monoxide. Yeah. And it doesn't show it there, but carbon monoxide has uh, double bond. And the reason is that oxygen no longer has three pairs of electrons, three electrons to bond. It only has two, so it limits what that is. And the other difference about this thing is that really all you're doing is a nitrogen has a, a plus seven charge, seven protons in the middle. And the carbon has... Seven. 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 Whereas the, the carbon has six and the oxygen has eight. So all you're doing is taking one proton from here and putting it there. So it's, it's virtually, the, I, I virtually did the same thing all over again. It was like a, hardly a change at all, except for the fact that you now have these two bonds, but the carbon has two more electrons with nothing to bond to. And so that, that makes this chemically active. I mean, if the nitrogen collides with, with another atom, all the electrons are already, already bonded, so it's inert. It's a stable molecule. This one is capable of reacting with other molecules, which is why normally you don't find carbon monoxide you find carbon dioxide, just to use up all the electrons. So this principle applies a lot, actually, astronomy, because you get a lot of these unfinished molecules in space. Uh, yep. Okay, then I finished that, and then, then I moved to Leiden, which is uh, where I worked for three and a half years. That was the first decent length of postdoc I did. And there I was working for astrochemists because, and my, my boss was, of course, quite clever. She always brought in people who had information she wanted, and she wanted to know about nitrogen and carbon monoxide, which is just, you know, like an amoeba kind of thing, um, which is a good way to do science if you have the funding to have a big group, I think. And Leiden also is a very beautiful place, not quite as cool as Amsterdam, like this. 
And it was also the first time I learned anything at all about astronomy. Like, uh, if, if anyone asks me, you know, what is a K4 star, if that even exists, you know, I, I unfortunately haven't learned that yet in, 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 in light enough. I, I've been studying things that are astrochemical in nature. So my, my background is kind of physics and chemistry and astronomy in a kind of a mush, but without, a, without too many details in anything, I guess. And so that's where I've been working for a few years. Um, and now I've, I've actually finished, I'm currently technically on holiday at the moment, although I don't tell the Colombian government, I think. And then I'll, I'll, I'll soon move, move to Paris, to the Paris Observatory, to start another, another fellowship there, working with more astronomers who are this time are interested in, in uh, places in the universe where there's a lot of radiation. So my group in, in Leiden was studying mostly protoplanetary disks, that's a picture there, of a new star forming with planets forming around it. These guys are interested in uh, highly irradiated, irradiated parts of the galaxy. So kind of related to the molecular stuff. And yeah, so, that, so that, that, that's been kind of fun. And I, I don't know what will happen next, but uh, this is the life you might end up with in a, or something vaguely parallel with this if you stick with science for a while. Hopefully you might even get a job, a permanent job faster than I did. So that might, uh, might be. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk briefly about the Netherlands since that's uh, the c connection of this, uh, this kind, of, kind of summer school we're giving. It's in Europe. It's tiny. Um, it's tiny. It has a population of, uh, in scientific units of 17 mega people. Whereas Colombia, it's, 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 not, it's not an order of magnitude bigger. So in astronomy terms, this is the same population. It's equal size. <laughs> um, you, can't, you can't say the same about, about the area. The area and the density are orders of magnitude different. Which, yeah, I'll look at that. Yeah, so that, that's interesting. Uh, the ele elevation is orders of magnitude difference. Um, in fact, I, I even read even more details about that. Average. It's the average. Yeah. But if, if, we, yeah, yeah, if, if, it's, if it's wrong, go to Wikipedia and change it. That's the, uh, yeah. Okay, if, if you have the C, which is at C, C, C level by definition, and then you have uh, the Netherlands, initially it's got, to, it's got to be higher than the C, otherwise we know about fluids, you know. But it rapidly drops down and it comes back up again, like this, something like this. So here we're at about one meter above sea level. Here we're down to minus seven meters in some places. You can't just stand here, you can't just with it. And about 50% of the country is at less than one meter. The entire country is less than one meter above sea level. With one place so high that it can get an average of 30 meters. I don't know where that is. Never been there. Where is it? The, the, you know, the, the old colonies, you mean? No. <laughs> what about Leiden? What do you think? Uh, it's, some of it's below sea level and some of it's above. <laughs> yeah. It's Leiden's 10 meters in average. Yeah. They, they actually built a hill in Leiden yeah. for emergencies, actually. That, that's true. If you go there, look at that hill. You might have seen it. Um, and uh, this, this flower thing. You might know the flower thing as well. I mean, Colombia is famous for coffee, but it's also famous for flowers. And I, I think it's catching up. It'll probably overtake the Netherlands at some point. Um, okay, and this, so this is the country, and this is where Leiden is, right there. Between Amsterdam, that's the capital city, Utrecht. Anyone heard of Utrecht? Okay, yeah. Uh, Rotterdam, that's famous for something. The Hague, also famous. And then uh, a lot of cities that are not that famous. That seems to be a works. This is the richest part of the country with all the <laughs> industry and the people. But it's all rich. Don't worry about that. Not like Wellesley in America. <laughs> and uh, is, is that, that's, that's right. That's, that's an order of magnitude difference again. 3.7 mega people. This is 0.35. <laughs> and I, I stole this slide from uh, uh, Bernard Brandel, maybe you don't know him, but you just staff him. He came here a few years ago, and he, he gave a talk, so I stole his slide. And it's good. It's, this is what Leiden looks like. It's beautiful, and the canals, and the tulips really are actually cool. When it snows and freezes, it's cool when that happens. But it's also, it's also like, you know, he's like a 45-year-old guy. He's Dutch. He's really nationally proud. He loves this chocolate box, you know, jigsaw puzzle stuff. So, so as, as a foreigner, you see other things as well, you know? Like, it's not always so perfect. 
Um, th this, this, this is nice, actually. This is, the Dutch people are very reserved. They stay in within themselves, except twice per year, they just go crazy. Wear orange, it's their color. They go on boats, they get drunk. It's kind of, it's kind of fun, actually. Um, this they do all the time. That, that's a piece of fish. I mean, I, I know you eat fish in Colombia, but you don't eat it like this raw, like straight from the sea. Uh, it's worth trying, but don't have two. Because you have lunch, but then you also have it for dinner for the rest of the next day's dinner. It just goes on and on. Uh, there's a lot of bikes. You've probably heard that one. Um, and, and, and this is a, an annual competition which is trying to jump over the canal on a pole, which is what this guy, this guy's doing all right, actually. We don't know if he's going to make it or not. <laughs> because the main problem is that you can't, you know, you stand at the edge. So he's initially about this high on the pole, and he jumps. And you need to be climbing the pole continuously to be high enough to land on the other side. Like, it's really... Bizarre, but, uh, <laughs> so, yeah. And that, that was it for that. No, that was the fun stuff. Now, concentrate. It's a kind of pole dance. <laughs> it's a pole dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, not so Okay. Which one, sorry? Uh, Debian testing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay, so the subject's a little bit multidisciplinary. I mean, it's, it's often called astrochemistry. Sometimes it's called molecular astrophysics. You could call it astrophysico modulo engineering, chemistry, observing, laboratory work, potentially. And, and so, but the, that's actually the best part about it, is that if, I mean, if you really want to focus on one thing, I mean, as a scientist, you need to be an expert, really expert of something. That's, that's important to be the world expert in something. But you want to have other interests as well. You want to, you know, it's good for yourself to have many things you know a lot about. And astrochemistry is perfect for that, because uh, I've drawn a spiral showing the interrelatedness of many things. And I mean, the, the, the most important thing is, is the universe which is why it's providing something to study. In this case, I mean, uh, this, in this particular case, we're having a, a molecular cloud. So you have a, a lot of dense gas and dust in these regions, and there's stars forming in there and all this kind of dramatic stuff. But it has a really dramatic shape because there's a series of really bright stars, and maybe that one as well, above, shining so much high-energy photons that it's kind of evaporating the structure. So there's really a, a flow of material in this giant multi-light year structure we're looking at which is really interesting. And I mean, to look at that, you then need to have you know, the, the facilities, the telescopes to look at it. Um, quick question, which telescope is this? Yeah. I mean, th th this, is, this has got to be more as important as Galileo's telescope. I mean, everybody in the world knows Hubble, right? It's uh, yeah, beautiful. Even from the, the film, you know, where it got smashed up. <laughs> um, and so, so astronomy really begins with the universe, but it's really defined, actually, I think, by the observing. I mean, every time they build a new telescope, like ALMA or Hubble, they, they see things they didn't expect or things they did expect, and it just redefines the whole subject. I mean, it's true as well, and uh, took about at lunch. I mean, in physics, they have the Higgs boson now. But, I mean, I'm, I'm no particle physicist, but they, I thought they thought the Higgs boson was there, and then they found it. It's kind of a confirmation, I guess. I don't know. But uh, in astronomy, it's just like that, you're continuously reinventing the field for observations. Um, astrochemistry, it's not enough just to look at the shape of these clouds. You need to know what it's made of, the, what the gas is made of, and that's when you need to do spectroscopy. In this case, you're looking not just at images, but you're looking at multi-wavelength uh, reductions of all this stuff here. And to understand spectroscopy, this is some molecules and some atoms in an interstellar cloud, somewhat like this one. You need to understand all the atomic physics, molecular physics that's producing the spectroscopic lines. I mean, this is, a, this is a very different field to this one. You're kind of in a different building in the university. I mean, and you need to know this not just in terms of... Uh, the general picture, you need to know the numbers, and that means you might even need to measure things in the laboratory. So there's actually astronomers in my department in Leiden who, who are not looking at telescopes, telescopes at all. They're in the laboratory with vacuum pumps and lasers doing real physics work just to understand this part so they can understand this part. So, so, that, so that's, that's kind of a, a real thing you can do in astronomy is actually laboratory work. Um, once you've nailed this stuff down, you understand, understand the spectrum, you, can, you then really need to build a kind of qualitative model of what you're looking at. I mean, this, this, this is only a two-dimensional projection of what's really there. You're not seeing everything involved. So you need to then invent a, a model of what really is you're looking at. That's, that's probably the most interesting part, I think, of theoretical astronomy, 
is inventing this model. I mean, this is all kind of work, and this is cool, but this is the part that's really where your brain comes into, becomes intuitive. So that's something a lot of people do. And finally, I mean, you've, you've got atoms, you've got light years, you've got telescopes, you've got models, you need to compute everything. Like, there's, there's not many people doing things on paper at the moment. You're really grinding a supercomputer to go around the circle, put it all together, and then hopefully come back at the universe itself. And that just goes on and on and on. That's really... So all of that comes into astrochemistry. That's the nice thing. I mean, my expertise, like I said, began kind of with this stuff and a bit of this. And recently I've been learning about a bit of this and a bit of this, so that's kind of the picture. Although what I found interesting was when I was making this, uh, trying to decide what to talk about and make some slides and stuff, I ended up doing more things about the stuff I knew less about. I mean, I was making this lecture and I was thinking, nah, I could talk about this, but oh, look, this is kind of fun to learn about as well. So we'll see if that works or not. Okay, I, and I made a list of all the things that we do, roughly. Um, today, I'm going to talk about molecules in space, just kind of observations and things like that, and uh, what that means. And then tomorrow, probably, I guess, we'll be talking about molecular spectroscopy, but the, the rotation of molecules. So this is a, one particular wavelength range we're interested in. Uh, then, then, then I've invented some uh, work to do in the computer lab, so it'll be fun. And then after that, I'll start talking about chemistry with some more computer work. And if there's time, I don't know how long this will take, actually. So if there's time, then we'll start looking at isotopes. And this is a very interesting part of the field. You don't normally think about isotopes. You think chemistry, carbon sticks to oxygen, it doesn't matter what isotope. In fact, you're probably told isotopes don't affect chemistry. Well, they do. In space, they do. So that's really interesting. Um, so that, that's kind of the plan, roughly beginning at the beginning. And, uh, and yeah, and so, so <laughs> please ask any questions. And we're doing that this morning pretty well, I think. So that looks, seems to be fine. And, and, and please point out any errors. Like, I love that. I mean, if you see an error, it, I know that. It's just a test. <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, it's good. And, and if, if you don't point out errors, I'd like to give you extra credit, which I don't think is possible. But we did get some free gifts, I think, from Lightem. So maybe we can come up with a system. For any mistake, I don't know, maybe they want the good use of the. Yeah? No, because. No. Well, no, it's, it's, it's because, as you know, scientists try to be really smart, and they, they want to be smart, which is nice, it's a good, a good thing to want, but then you sometimes get a little egotistical about it, you don't want to be wrong, whatever, so it's really important you point out my errors for the sake of my personality, like, I don't, I don't want to be left thinking I did everything correctly, that's, that's clearly not the case. So, so a test. Does anyone have anything uh, to say about the slide? We can just breeze right past this, or is there any... No comments from the audience? I mean, we, we talked about a possible you know, gift. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're right. It, it is a cow. So, <laughs> see, I, I, it's always a test. I'm always right. I, I make a mistake. <laughs> okay. Enough. Okay, yeah, so, so the basic idea is I'll talk about the parts of the, the galaxy, nothing extragalactic today, that I think I know something about, that have molecules, that astrochemistry is defined by the presence of molecules, more or less. And they can be observed at different wavelengths. So I'll talk about wavelengths and, uh, and discuss some of the details of, of those places in the, in the universe, in the galaxies, right? And um, there is some literature. Uh, I, I don't think you need to read it for this, for what uh, you need to do for this course, but, but I'll put, put it up anyway because these are kind of what I've, uh, some things I've read. Um, this, this is a nice chapter about, which kind of covers this lecture actually. It talks about all the places in the galaxy where you see molecules, some of the details, nothing too, too numeric or too detailed. Um, and I even found a free link to it, which I don't know why that was free. It might have been a mistake by the book publisher. Um, there's another one. This is, this, is, this is my boss actually in Leiden. She's a very talented astrochemist. In this case, she's talking about mostly infrared spectroscopy, but also covers a lot of things in, in space. Uh, there's the, the journal one, which is not free, but the archive has a free copy. Uh, this is another lighter professor, and he's kind of a, he's a different, he kind of has a different take on this chemistry. He's interested in different parts of it. But his, so his paper, The Molecular Universe, and this other paper, The Molecular Universe, kind of go together. And then he wrote a book called The Molecular Universe. So <laughs> the universe is molecular, apparently. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, right, so, so astrophysics, and, astrophysics and astrochemistry are a bit separate in the sense that this whole structure is defined by temperatures and gravity and stars and all this kind of thing, things. That, that creates the shape and it creates the environment. But the chemistry, in some ways, is the, the reactions going on inside. So you could, if you're an astrochemist, just say, this is, this is the Eagle Nebula, the Pillars of Creation, or whatever it's called, and therefore I will assume this is what it is, and then I'll do the chemistry on the inside. And that's actually a pretty good approach, because doing everything at once is pretty complicated. Alternatively, an astrophysicist, because chemistry affects physics. Molecules emit radiation, change temperatures, change densities. So he might assume chemistry, this is what's happening in the chemistry, now I'm gonna calculate the shape of the Eagle Nebula. This is kind of the reverse thing. And I'll ideally you should do both. In reality, it's too complicated to do both all the time. So one person will write, write a paper on something, another person will write another paper using that information, kind of leapfrog their way up in a kind of indirect way. That's kind of an interesting point. And then, so if we take the picture that we're not gonna worry too much about where things come from, astrophysics, just think about chemistry, then these, this is what the galaxy is made of in terms of molecular, molecularly interesting objects. I mean, there's no black holes here because are a bit weird for molecules that are written too intense. The center, of the, the center of the galaxy has interesting chemistry, but generally it's, yes? Yeah, I have a question. Is the name astrochemistry is actually, uh, <laughs> this, this term, astro, astrochemistry, is actually used by, by, the, by the expert, for the experts use the astrochemist yeah. as an yeah. official term? Yes? Yep. Okay. It's, 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 it's one out over, um, Molecular astrophysics, which is too long. Okay. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. And even to the point where other astro lots of astronomers, if there's no astrochemists in their building, they think it's, I think, general, I think often it has the impression of being something pretty weird, you know, like it's not a, yeah, anyway. Okay, uh, so, so you, you may have seen this before, but I'll explain it anyway, in case you haven't. Uh, the cycle of matter within the galaxy and, and between generations of galaxies, I suppose. Uh, you begin generally with space, which is very empty, except where it collects into a kind of a increased density of mass, which in this case could be a, a diffuse cloud, meaning it's, you can see through it, it's not that dense actually. Um, it could collect further into a, a really dense cloud where it's under its own gravity, it's starting to get a density which is no longer diffuse, but might be opaque, you can't see through it. And eventually it gets enough mass that it begins to collapse under its own gravitational weight. I mean, it do doesn't collapse instantly like a black hole, I suppose, might, but it has to release the energy because every time it collapses, gravitational energy is converted to, converted to thermal energy that needs to somehow be released, which I think is, yeah, some arrows on there. Um, so these, these are actually two different environments for molecules because this one, radiation can get in, and this one, radiation can't. And there's another problem. Radiation can't get in, but it gets so dense, maybe a star forms, and then there's radiation on the inside. So that's kind of a different regime again. Um, <clears throat> okay, eventually stars form. There's a picture of a star that might be inside there. And it forms as, not maybe as a protostar, so it doesn't have full star-like qualities, but it's very hot and releases ultraviolet radiation, very dense, like a star. And that'll be surrounded by uh, not just a clump of cloud, but it now forms a disk because of angular momentum and things like that. That's astrophysics. Uh, and <laughs> the interesting thing about that is that you have a star ra radiating its own disk, so you have temperatures which are high in the middle and decreasing, it's kind of a really interesting place to look because you have big gradients of temperature and density. It's kind of a uh, more complicated but a more interesting object to study for chemistry. And this is, this is uh, I, mean, I mean, Alma can study all these things, but this is really where Alma is really driving the field right now because I haven't written this on here, but this is big, this is smaller, and this is tiny. So you need that enormous baselines in order to be able to even see that. Uh, eventually, the disk turns into planets. You have a solar system, you know what that's like. Um, in, in the solar system, you have the planets, they have atmospheres, you have comets and meteorites. And these are kind of chemically interesting as well. And what's really interesting about them is that the planets themselves are made up of this disk, and there's, there's chemistry in the disk. So the chemistry in this disk affects the planets. I mean, Earth is not like Mars, it's not like Pluto because of the chemistry at this time. And these comets, I mean, you might have heard of the, the, the mission to the comet uh, last year, it's still kind of there, I think. And so that, that comet mission, the whole point of that, one of the points of that, was that comet also formed in this disk. 
but then meanwhile has been uh, most of the time way out of the solar system and it hasn't changed. It's been a, a, a time locked sample of this disk. So by landing on a comet and measuring it's what it's made of, you're really measuring this. So you're kind of going back in time to the Earth's uh, solar system's formation. Anyway, enough of that. Uh, eventually, a star like our solar system will live for billions of years, and then eventually it'll uh, expand as a red giant and throw off a lot of material as well in its, in its uh, final uh, pulsations. And then a, a lot of uh, gas and dust gets released, which goes back in the, into the interstellar medium and starts the cycle again. Okay, so all of these are different densities, temperatures, etc., and uh, they're all studied in astro Okay, uh, the units. Now, you, know, you definitely might know this, but this, so this is the kind of thing where I, I had to learn new things for this course, you know, this is a change to me. Uh, astro astronomical unit, the distance from the Earth to the Sun. That's an excellent unit because we all know how big that is, kind of. It's difficult to imagine, but it's, uh, it's imaginable. The parsec, which is my favorite unit in astronomy, because as the, the definition, in case you don't know it, it was new to me, was that the Sun and the Earth, as you row down, go around the Sun, and you slightly change the angles looking at some other star, the parallax between there and there, or there and there. And that, that angle, you measure in arc seconds, and so if you have an angular difference of one arc second, then you have one arc seconds parallax, one parsec. Yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, the Jansky, I guess he just thought he didn't want to, I mean, did, <laughs> did Jansky even know the power he was measuring? Did they call it the Jansky because he said the power is one? I don't know, but that's a good one. And the other nice thing about it is if you're studying particularly protoplanetary disks, okay, if this is a protoplanetary disk, conveniently side on to the Earth, and you observe it with ALMA, no other telescope could possibly do it, And you measure some arc seconds, whatever that is, right? And then say that you know this distance as well, which is possible to do using astrometry of a supernova or something that you kind of think you know how it should act, you can judge its distance, or parallax or something else, I suppose. Um, then you want to know how, how big is your disk? I mean, is it as big as the solar system? Is it bigger than the solar system? It's simple. It's just the, the size of the disk is the distance of the disk times the parallax. And parsecs, and arc seconds, and parsecs, and AU. So AU and parsecs actually really go together. Like it's a, that's a good unit. Um, Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. <laughs> Is it, um, Is, it, is it like is one pass parsec uh, when the angle between the sun and the earth makes an angle of one arc of a second? Or the angle between both, uh, uh, I don't know how to say it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Positions of the Earth. Yeah, so, well, so, so, so this, this is the definition. The Earth moves, the star. Yep. I mean, okay, you, so you have stars that are so far away that they don't move. So then you measure it. So the star's over here, far away. As you go around, this one is moving back and forth in front of this distant field. And so that's the angle you're measuring. Right. Yeah. You're measuring between the line between the Earth and the star, and the and the Sun and the star. Well, I mean, in, I mean, in that I mean, diagram is that angle. I mean, but imagine the Earth moves to here. This is where the two, or well, more likely over here. Yeah, that's my question. Yeah, yeah. Between, so, so the Earth, which so, two points? I mean, I mean, this distance is huge. This distance is tiny. So you can move the Earth around. Yeah. So if, if the Earth was positioned here, you observe the star and how this angle changes. That's the angle you're going to use to calculate the... But that's, that's half the, the size of the angle that... Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So which one is it? No, I mean, this, this is right. This is the right one. Yeah. That's the yeah. right one. Okay, that was my question. Which yeah, one's yeah, yeah. What's the right one? Thanks. Okay. Um, oh. Oh, yeah, uh, masses in astronomy are, are actually often considered in terms of the, the sun, solar mass. Sometimes in planetary disks where the mass is very small, they might use this, the mass of... Uh, uh, Jupiter, so it's a bit of a small convenient unit. And if you're releasing something to the public, the newspaper, you say the mass of the oceans of the Earth. That's the special unit. And energy is often in terms of the amount of energy put out by the sun. 
So that's just a strong mean. Okay. Um, so in those units, we can consider a little more detail these things. Uh, beginning again with this diffuse cloud. Size is about 10 parsecs. That's a reasonable size. Maybe less, maybe more. So that's well measurable with parallax. 500 solar masses, so it's bigger than the sun, even though it's very diffuse. The temperature is, is this is actually kind of high. It's between maybe 30 and 100. And it's, it's so high because of its radiation is kind of in this cloud, because it's diffuse, there can be some reasonable temperature. Pardon me. And a density of 200 particles per cubic centimeter. So what that means, yeah, I guess you can imagine it, but what that means is that most of the interstellar medium in the galaxy has a density of about one particle per cubic centimeter. So, so, which is good, I can actually draw that thing. So that's actually an accurate picture of the density of the interstellar medium in the galaxy. So this, so this is definitely more. This is increased by two orders of magnitude from that. Between the galaxies, it's like 0.2 particles per cubic centimeter. Like, it's really low. Um, anyway, so these, these clouds, they don't have to be so small. They can be much larger, 40 parsecs across half, half a million times the mass of the, uh, the sun. This is the, the giant molecular clouds. And those are pretty much on the way towards being dense, but enormous. And, uh, and so that's actually where stars form. The, these diffuse clouds can form and dissipate or form and just exist for a long period of time. But they have to have enough mass to collapse under gravity within themselves to eventually form a giant molecular cloud with much more mass and maybe a dense cloud where it really compresses down to higher densities of not 200 particles per cubic centimeter, but maybe 10,000 or 1,000 to 10,000. So then the density is getting harder to draw on that kind of diagram. And a lot smaller as well. It's compressed down to less than one parsec. And the temp temperature, ah, the temp I put a range of temperatures, 10 to 300 Kelvin. I mean, 300 Kelvin is this room. And if we were in Leiden, here it's like 320 or something. <laughs> and and uh, so that's actually reasonably warm. And it, but also 10, this entire range. And the reason is, is that the question is, are stars forming inside here or not? If there's no stars forming, it's totally dark, so the temperature gets really low, 10 Kelvin, almost absolute zero. If there are stars inside, they can locally heat their part of the dense cloud, give you hundreds of Kelvin, maybe even 1,000 Kelvin. OK. Um, then zooming on these smaller objects, they're now a lot smaller, AU units rather than parsecs, so the size of the solar system. That makes sense. Uh, much less the mass of the sun. So, well, the, the star might have the mass of the sun, but the disk around it is much less. Like most of the mass is on the star with just a Jupiter mass or so in the disk. Uh, temperatures also range a lot because it's hot in the middle and cold on the outside. You have this central star. And the density changes a lot from 10,000, the same as this case, up to 10 to the 15. So that's uh, you know, orders of magnitude more particles, almost approaching a appreciable kind of density and pressure to you know, the real world. And that's because this disk is contracting itself. It's kind of collapsing in on itself. So in the middle, it's dense and warm, and it's a real gradient of condition. OK. And yeah. What causes the, the rotation when the, the matter goes from dense cloud to accretion disk? Okay. What causes the, the rotation? Well, the, the main thing is that originally, this dense cloud actually has some rotation. Because it's not just a static cloud slowly coming down. It's a turbulent mass. And it might even have formed, I mean, it's, it might even have formed out of a larger giant molecular cloud, which kind of is turbulent. So if two parts of the giant molecular cloud are kind of, has some kind of velocity share with a dense cloud in the middle, where they often form, then there'll be some rotation of that dense cloud. So kind of like the water in the toilet, actually. You know, eventually, it'll compress down. And all that angular momentum, which you don't notice when it's big, becomes really important when it's small. So it's spinning up as it shrinks, like a, maybe a ballerina is a, a nicer metaphor than the toilet. And, and, and so that's what happens. It's because of that. And so it could spin in either direction, depending on those initial conditions. Good? OK, good. Um, and then final, this, this, this last phase is kind of uh, a little bit the reverse of this. There's, there's still a star in the middle, but it's a red giant, so it doesn't have a lot of uh, ultraviolet light. So it's more of a, just a warm star. Sorry, I have a question. Um, I wonder if there is any parameter that 
tell uh, something about how frequent are the chemical reactions in those uh, systems? Yep. The, well, I've maybe as a function of the density, or I don't know. The two important things are density, temperature, three. Den density and temperature, which are written on here for that exact reason, and ultraviolet light, which I've not written, but it's often described. So yes, exactly, because. Sorry, density, temperature, and the third is? Ultraviolet light. Okay. Like, if you recall, I was studying ultraviolet light in my uh, early years, and that's why I ended up getting into this, because that's really relevant to this kind of stuff. And I mean, we'll go through it later, but actually, I mean, if you have a high temperature, the particles are moving faster. They kind of go through more volume per unit time, and then so they're more likely to collide. That's the basic thing. Yeah, that's, that's why I put it up there. The size doesn't matter. I mean, we're studying chemistry. We only care about microscopic processes. That's just to give you an idea. Um, okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now, 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 I've shown you. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I really understand the, the previous slide. You have two scales for the diffuse clouds. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, be, okay. These two scales. Because, because really there's no actual scale. I mean, clouds exist at all scales. The smaller ones are generally denser, but you could have a small diffuse cloud. So, th so this is the beginning of interstellar clouds that you might actually be able to observe because it's, when it's thick enough to see an effect, but really they go all the way up to these giant molecular clouds and with, with a con, 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 continuum in between, really. So that's the and the other question is, as you can see that in, that, in, in this cycle, you start with a huge mass and end, uh, end up with a yes. very small mass. Yes, because, S yeah. Yes, so my, my question is, what is the efficiency, what is the fraction of a diffuse cloud which is in the form of a stars or yeah. which is in the form of uh, planets? So, Within this, so if, if a diffuse cloud was big enough to be called a giant molecular cloud, not actually diffuse anymore, it's more, it's more opaque actually than diffuse, but anyway. And within that, these form within. In most cases, there's exceptions, but in most cases, you have these dense cores within this giant cloud, and, the, and that's why they, they don't have the complete mass. And you can form tens or hundreds actually within the giant molecular cloud. So this is, it's like a, a multi-scaling picture actually. Okay, so the idea now is to step through some of those environments and show you some observations of molecules and explain how those are made and so forth. I'm uh, sorry to insist. Sorry? I want to know what is the fraction of a ah. dense cloud which is actually converted into stars. Do you know this? this is 10%, 1%? What's that? 1%? One a ten yeah, I mean, I, I, a tenth, or I think that might even be an upper limit, actually. Because, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I don't know, but it's definitely not more than a tenth. Okay. And, I mean, it's, there's the problem that even the, the, the material that falls within here, I mean, so these form within the dense cloud, forms within the giant molecular cloud, for one thing. And even the material that falls on the star, a large amount of that gets blown off right. the star. Because you're, and, even the, and particularly if you have, have a very large star, an, o, an A or a B or an O star, and it produces so much radiation inside this cloud, it pff, explodes the cloud as well. And then if it's supernovas, that's it, you know, the cloud is gone. There's no uh, way to stand up to that. So not more than 10%, I think. So in the same way as baryonic matter is very strange in the, in the universe, stars and planets are actually, which are the, 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 the rare. That they are the, the strange things in, in, in the universe. Actually, the, the normal things are clouds, uh, mole molecules in the, in the interstellar medium. If somebody no, comes from a parallel normal, universe and asks, I mean, what is the universe? I mean, the normal thing is just hydrogen atoms floating around in the middle of nowhere. That, that's the normal thing, you know? Like a, I mean, I, I guess there's dark matter, whatever that is, is even more normal. Yeah, yeah, yeah so the, the, this is the exception, but then, uh, yeah, but it's the interesting part, I guess. Okay. Okay, so uh, interstellar cloud, Rho Ophiuchus. Uh, the Rho Ophiuchus is not the cloud, you can see the shadow, it's the star. So you, when you talk about a cloud, often you talk about the cloud that you see because there's a star behind it being blocked by the cloud. So that's, that's a common nomenclature. Um, it's a cluster? Or just Ophiuchus, a yeah, 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 well, it's, it's a constellation. No, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't know. Is it? Yeah. Just a star? 
It's, it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, that, that is a good question. In, in, in the end, in terms of spectroscopy, I think the effect is the same. But yeah, that is a question. Um, and yeah, so this, this is a, a visible light image. I mean, not technically visible light in the sense that if you looked at this with a telescope, with an eyepiece, this is what you'd see. But it's using visible wavelength light, certain frequency ranges within visible, and recreate this image. So you, you could kind of see it. And then it's really clear there's a molecular cloud, a diffuse cloud absorbing the light. Um, that's a Hubble image. So that's where that came from. But also, uh, there's equally or as good measurements re recorded from the ground. I mean, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope, it's, uh, I guess in Spanish it would be the TVL or the TLV or something. I don't know. I'm working on the T TMG. <laughs> um, and so the advantage with this is that it's actually an interferometer. You can see there's a f more than one telescope for one thing. And it, you can do very precise spectroscopy because you basically have a regular lab here. You can operate on the ground to do some uh, really careful work, whereas if Hubble is in space. You can't really go there to do anything careful. But then it's above the atmosphere, which we've seen a picture of the atmosphere. So, so th this, is, this is visible, visible spectroscopy, uh, visible astronomy, showing an interstellar cloud, like I said. Yeah, Hubble Space Telescope, uh, telescopic uh, space. Yeah. Space, yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so this is the most convenient and even the most kind of, like, most aesthetically attractive way to do astronomy, but it's, it's, it's actually about the worst way to study molecules, um, it turns out. And that's, that's uh, because of the electromagnetic spectrum, which I will explain. Um, the basic picture we have is the photon energy. That's, that's the quantum mechanical way of looking at it. We have more energy in uh, that way. In spectroscopy, you might talk about the wavelength. This, this you've studied before, I suspect. Um, the visible wavelength is a relatively small part of what this picture shows, arbitrarily. But the interesting thing about astrochemistry is that we're interested in, in all of it. Like, that's the Hubble giving us some information. But all the infrared telescopes, the radio telescopes, the ultraviolet telescopes, even X-ray, gamma rays, not so much. I don't know much about them. But X -ray, even X-rays can be interesting if you're looking at ions in the interstellar medium. But certainly these cases, it's all, it's, you want it all. I mean, visible is the least important part, even though it's still useful. Um, so here, it's here they've labeled some of these parts. There's a couple of others worth knowing. Uh, UV visible, the near infrared. So that's the part of the infrared near to the visible. The far infrared, that's the part of the infrared far from the visible, that's this side. Um, the millimeter slash submillimeter, that's, that's ALMA's territory, and there's no guessing about which wavelength that has. It's a millimeter long, that's, so that's exactly uh, in here somewhere. Or, or I mean, I, 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 I know that uh, she likes to call these radio waves, but in my group we call them submillimeter millimeter waves, so I don't know if you're going to agree on that. And there's microwave, which is also in this region, uh, and radio. So, 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 all, all, so these, I might use these terms meaning the boundary of infrared and radio waves. And that's, that's, that's actually, a particularly right now, a particularly fruitful part of observing molecules. Uh, that's it. And here's this picture again that, that, that Carmen also showed us, because the whole, prob the whole fun first question of observing outside the visible range is atmospheric attenuation. So on this graph, we have the wavelength again. Uh, micrometers, not meters. So one micron is there, 0.1 micron, that's uh, 100 nanometers on the previous scale. Uh, a meter, I guess, is here, but I don't know if you do much with a meter of wavelength. And so what we have here is the picture, not of the light that gets absorbed by the, the atmosphere, but the light that gets passed by the atmosphere. Uh, this curve shows this, just the effect of bouncing, of scattering of uh, atmospheric particles as a simple scattering kind of thing, process, without any quantum mechanics or this bizarre stuff. And in the visible region, it has a slope going up as you increase wavelength, hence the sky is blue. That's the answer. Scattering has a slope up at the visible wavelength. And so that forms a nice curve which really drops off at uh, ultraviolet. So that's why there, there, are, there are no ultraviolet telescopes on the world. That's why I'm saying it, because you just cannot uh, observe anything because of the scattering. Beyond that, however, you also have all the molecules in the atmosphere, and because of their absorption of their vibrational, electronic, and rotational modes, 
the quantum mechanical uh, absorption lanes, then you lose all this other part of the atmosphere as well. Um, the visible, it, you hardly lose anything. That's why we call it visible rather than invisible. The infrared, you lose some. The far infrared, and sorry, I didn't say, I didn't say extreme infrared. That's a new one as well. It's even further away. You, you, you see nothing. The atmosphere is invisible. Infrared spectroscopy fails on the ground. Far infrared spectroscopy in astronomy. The millimeter and ALMA, it starts to pick up again. And you saw the same graph reversed in Kalman's talk, where you see the longer wavelength parts of the ALMA band, you see really well, and under any conditions, the water lines, which is what this is, reduce the shorter wavelength parts. Okay. And so that dictates the telescopes that you use. Um, <clears throat> for example, here we are invisible. That's the VLT again. And so that you can, that's clearly on the ground. Uh, the UV, I said, gets completely destroyed by the scattering and also the, the absorption by molecules, so there's, you, need a, you need a space telescope. And the thing is, there, there, there's pretty much none. I mean, the Hubble telescope has a UV capacity, but it's, uh, there's, there's really only been one true UV telescope which can observe into the deep UV where a lot of the interesting molecular stuff is happening. Uh, the FUSE, Far Ultraviolet Fish Shop Explorer, but that, that ended service about five years ago, and there's currently no plans to build another one. So this is, this is a part of astronomy, which is my part of astronomy, which is a little bit dead for the next 20 or 30 years, unfortunately. That's the, uh, maybe you should think about not getting to that one. Uh, the, the near infrared, you have some transmissions, but some gaps. So if you use an aeroplane, that's good enough. You don't need to go to space. That's the Sophia. That's the, that's the telescope pointing out of an aeroplane. Strange. Uh, the far infrared, you need a space telescope again. And at the moment, there's nothing in space that's really looking at this either. Um, this was the Herschel telescope, which finished operation a couple of years ago. And there's been a couple of others, and there'll probably be some other capacity, the, uh, the JWST will have some, some far infrared capacity. And so there, there's going to be new programs for this part of the spectrum in the future. So that's a good area to get into, actually. And in the millimeter, there's ALMA, which pretty much, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's the game in town, if you can get time. OK. Um, OK, so that's how we look at the radiation. Where does it come from? I mean, most of the radiation comes from stars. Uh, the black body radiation curve of stars shows you that at longer wavelengths, they produce nothing. What that means is that a millimeter emission from a star, or infrared emission even, depending on the star, is pretty weak. Ultraviolet, they can produce a lot. This is nanometers now, so 100 nanometers. That's the ultraviolet, depending on the star. And that's critical. I said ultraviolet radiation is one of the key parameters to, to chemistry, like density, temperature, ultraviolet radiation. So if you have this, say, at M dwarf, or a, a cold star, 3,000 Kelvin on its surface, the sun's a bit hotter, then it really doesn't produce a lot of radiation at 100 nanometers, ultraviolet radiation. The sun produces some. A hot star, a, b, or an O star, dominates down here. Like, it just irradiates everything with a lot of UV. And so that, that's a critical thing to bear in mind. Um, but aside from having a temperature, stars, of course, don't look so beautiful. If you look at their actual spectrum, it's a function of wavelengths, how much energy they produce. Now, oh, there's a human. Um, because of absorption. The, this, this, is the, this is an actual spectrum of the sun, which changes with time, but not a whole lot. So what we're seeing here is a black body curve, 5,000 Kelvin. We're seeing some excess, and that's, that's actually, I'm not completely sure of all the causes of that, but one of the causes at least is molecular emission, and another cause is colder spots on the sun and so forth. Um, but the interesting thing to, to lead into spectroscopy is all these absorption lines. If you look at the spectrum of the sun, on, as if you put it in a prism, you see, the, you, see, you see the absorption lines where the intensity is reduced. I mean, this is the classic picture from first year physics, but in reality, you always look at a picture like this, a graph of intensity with spectrum, where lines, absorption lines are dips. Sorry, what's the y-axis? Sorry, uh, sorry, my, I apologize. So th this is wavelength. Uh, peaks here at about 500 nanometers, the visible. That's why it's the sun, is visible. Uh, and so forth. And this, this is just the arbitrary scale intensity of energy radiated by the sun. Yeah, sorry, it's arbitrary. I mean, the, the original graph might have had a scale, which I didn't write down. What is the source of this non-wavelength emission? Yeah, so there's, so th I mean, th 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 there's colder spots, and there's actually uh, emission from molecules and atoms from the sun itself, which can be at longer wavelengths. But I mean, this, this is a... There's not a lot, yeah. So this, yeah, effectively, kind of uh, the non-block bit, and the, effectively the the quantum nature of the sun rather than the 
black body measure of the zone. Um, yep. And uh, I, guess, I guess I should say that in this case, most of the lines are due to a, a, a atomic absorption, or even atomic ionization as well, is another kind of common thing, um, which I guess I can do. Anyway, the point is that in, in all cases where we study absorption, not just the sun, you'll have a radiation field, black body or otherwise, you'll have the material in between. In this case, uh, the material was well, basically the sun itself, uh, I won't draw on the board, but if you have the black body sun, and you can imagine an atmosphere on the sun, a photosphere full of atoms in various states of various kinds, doing this absorption, that's in here, and then you observe something on the Earth. Same thing as if you looked at that interstellar cloud with Rho of Eucus behind it, you'll get the same picture. But you'll know you're studying the cloud, not the star. In fact, distinguishing the star from the cloud in that kind of case is the challenge. Um, and we'll quickly talk about electrons again. Um, so this picture, I, 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 th I think, is pretty interesting. The, um, this, this is just a picture of, of the electronic states of, of the hydrogen atom. I know you've studied that, but we'll draw it on the board anyway. Because it relates to this one. So as, as, as you know from the Bohr model of the atom, the hydrogen atom has a positive charge in the middle. In fact, let's make it a lithium atom. Three positive charges in the middle. And then it has electrons. And this, if you know from the uh, standard picture of atomic shells around the atom. And these, as you know, have discrete levels of energy. This is, this is radius. But also, because of the electrostatic forces, it's really a measure of energy as well, inverse measure. And the thing to remember is that because of quantum mechanics, the you need, this is not really a particle, it's really a wave. So we can, yep, yep. And so we can even draw that as a diagram. This is zero, comes back, two pi radian. So this is the angle around the atom. And we know we have a wave. And we know that we have to have a con 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 continuity of this wave. Otherwise, we get a discontinuity. And in quantum mechanics, that means an infinite velocity r r rubbish. So this wave has to fulfill a continuity. Oops. A, c a continuity of phase from the beginning to the end. And that gives you these discrete levels, basically. You've got to have a full number of oscillations of your wave. And just to remind you once again that in the case of the lithium atom, if you're going to have an absorption that is a photon carrying some energy, is absorbed effectively by this electron on the outside, and that goes to a higher orbital with more oscillations in the wave absorbing the energy. And so that's the quantum mechanical picture of the electronic excitation. And that's the photon that's been lost producing the missing photons in the solar spectrum. And the, the reason I bring it up is that this photon has a distinctive energy, which we'll call enough energy to, to be about, let's say, I don't know, in its lowest case, 100 to 300 nanometers. Which, if you remember from the uh, spectrum graph, that's the ultraviolet, that's, that's the beginning of the visible, or into the visible. Maybe I should make that 500. So these electrons have a distinctive energy that this photon needs to match of about a visible or ultraviolet wavelength equivalent energy. And the same thing happens to mo mo molecules, where now you have a much more complex picture of the electrons, not just spheres like this diagram of this particular atom. But in this case, you, you have a, a benzene molecule. So there's a carbon at each point here. And all the various electrons form a non-spherical shape around that. But the same picture appeals where if you absorb a photon, one of these electrons becomes more excited, produces more oscillations in the wave, more nodes, effectively, of its uh, electron density and so forth. And so that's the same picture as this. And you get the same kind of energies about a visible or UV photon energy to go from a ground state benzene to an excited state benzene with an electron in a higher state. So that basically is the cause of that visible spectrum of the sun with atoms. And in some cases, you might have some molecules. Not benzene. I don't think there's any benzene in the sun. Um, so that's one way you can uh, absorb a photon.
electronic absorption, the first one. Electronic transitions, and I've given that a U unit of 5 EV. Um, the, the, the EV is a unit more or less like the parsec in the astronomical unit. It makes complete sense. And that if you have one electron and you have a potential of one, e, one volt, let's put the electron on here, then the electron will move to the potential and gain one EV, one electron volt of energy. Simple. Um, so that's the, that's the energy scale I, I tend to use, and that's the most popular energy scale kind of you people use in experimental physics and kind of particle interactions to do with radiation and molecules. And so we have this picture of electronic transitions. The energy is about 5 EV, which is a visible or UV photon. But we need to consider the other modes in the case of molecules, because a molecule, as we know, Is, is this at all clear, by the way? I had trouble seeing your uh, pictures. It's hard to see. Well, I really thought about this diagram, so I want this one to be good. The other ones don't matter. Okay. Okay, so this, the simplest possible molecule has to have more than one atom in it. So two atoms, and the only degree of freedom describing these two atoms is the distance between them. So that's what I put on the scale, just between the atoms. Um, and if, if, this was an, if, this was an, if this was an atom, not a molecule, we describe the energy levels kind of by lines. This would be the, roughly the energy levels of the hydrogen atom. We just say this is the energy increases as the electrons get excited. In the case of a molecule, that energy depends on this distance. So rather than draw an energy level, we have to draw an energy curve, potential energy curve, like that. And the, the important thing is, if you have a molecule, what you don't have is two atoms that fly apart. By definition, a molecule is stable, sticks together. So you have to have a minimum in this potential energy curve. So that minimum energy, that's what we call, if you like, the, uh, that's the minimum energy of the molecule. That's its ground state, which I've drawn there. And uh, on the other hand, if you excite one of the electrons, you get a different curve, like this. And so you have an excited state. So exactly like an atom, you have excited electronic states, but now you describe them as potential energy curves. And this then provides a, a, another opportunity in that because of the attractive forces of the electrons, the electrostatic attraction, you effectively have two, two molecules bound together inside this well, which must exist, otherwise it's unstable. And so that gives you quantization, the particle in a box of uh, quantum mechanics, which you don't know it well, you just have to believe me, let's not get too much into that, of vibrational oscillations within the molecule. So what that means is that you can have the ground state electronically, the ground state vibrationally, the molecules are stationary almost, and they become more and more excited. And, and this, is, this is related again to the question of oscillations, how many how many nodes you have in a, in a wave function. But the important thing is these have an energy separation which is much less than the electronic energy separation. From 5 EV to about 1 EV. So now we're talking... Oh. I, I don't understand the difference between the X and the A curve. Okay, well, the hydrogen atom, this first level, we call it N equals 0, or 1. <laughs> 1, yeah, 1. <laughs> we call it N equals 1. In molecules, this, this pattern is a bit chaotic. This is an excited state, this is an excited state, that's another one. They don't have this nice layering. So there's kind of no good n numbering system. So by convention, the bottom one is called X, the next one's called A. Rather than, that's N equals zero, N equals one. The third one's called B, C, D, E. And uh, I don't know what happens when they get back to X. I don't know. That's never happened in my experience. But In an atom, the, ele the energy is the energy of the electron, but in a molecule, you have the energy of the, the binding energy, energy between the nucleus, 
the, the nuclei and the yep. energy of the electrons. Yep. So, so, so okay. So, the, the definition of this curve is for, choose a separation of your two atoms, calculate the energy of the, of the electrostatic energy. So, that's all the electrons with each other, electrons with the nuclei, nuclei together, and that's what that is. You, and you change the separation, that energy will change, making a curve. I mean, technically, you have to consider things like electron spins, nuclear spins. You can include correction factors to do if it's moving slowly. This is a bit of a mess, which you, you know. But in principle, it's all the, all, the, all the electrostatic forces. Just like for an atom, if you have a multi-electron atom, you consider all the electrostatic forces between the electrons as well, not just with the nucleus. OK, and the other question is, in, okay, in, in equilibrium, these two molecules, one in the ground and one in the excited state, lies in the, I mean, the nuclei lies in the bottom of the potential core, uh, uh, yeah. the potential, right? But the electrons could be so in any energy. Okay. Right, so, 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 so this is the, so, okay. If, if we picked this point on the curve, this is the very bottom of the curve, the most stable ground state or configuration. Or yeah. Then say we absorb a photon, so energy enters the system, so that means we have to go up on this scale eventually arriving at this point. So what that means is that one of these electrons, this is all the electrons in the molecule, one of the electrons goes into an excited state, just like the picture I rubbed out. Okay, and so you then have moved on this curve from the ground state up to here. The problem is this is not now in the well. There's, there's a potential gradient, so you have a force. I mean, the gradient of potential is a force. And it's a force towards more nuclear separation. So after this happens, the molecule will, will start to go like this. Uh, okay. So then there's kind of a, yeah, it's, it, it's this complex, yes. yeah. Anyway, the, the important thing is to, uh, I don't know, the, one of the important things is to appreciate <coughs> this is like an atom, basically. It has about the same energy gap, same wavelength range that you'd observe the absorption. Whereas this is much less energy. The vibrational energy is about 1 eV. So that's, that's now a photon with enough energy to be infrared. So that's, that's the difference between these two kinds of molecular motion. The third kind is, is rotation. Uh, if the molecule is stationary, it, has, it starts to rotate. That's some extra angular momentum you've introduced, some extra rotational kinetic energy. And so that has to come from somewhere. And a photon can provide that energy. But that's a very small amount of energy. So there we're talking about less than a vibrational step. And so now we're talking about a milli EV, one, uh, 0 0.001 EV. And now we're now in the microwave, radio, submillimeter, whatever you want to call it, regime. So each wavelength range, approximately, can be associated with one of these kinds of molecular motion. Why the atmosphere is so opaque to the far infrared? So what kind, uh, there's a question for you, Jorge. What kind of molecular motion is associated with the far infrared? Rotation. Uh, well, okay, well, it's kind, of, it's, okay, it's kind of on the boundary. Rotation and vibration, that's fine. Okay. okay, and so what that means is that there's a lot of molecules in the atmosphere that rotate. Water is the big one. Even though it's not the most common thing in the atmosphere, it has a lot of capacity to vibrate and rotate. And so that's the reason why, you, because the, all the water is available to, do, to perform this kind of rotation. If you go to higher energy, there's actually a gap. Um, yeah, this graph shows it. If you, if you have an infrared photon, it'll come in and it'll excite one of these kind of transitions. If you have an ultraviolet photon, it'll jump up to here. If you have a photon here, there's nothing to excite. So that's why you have a gap in the visible, because there's molecules up here doing some exciting, potentially. Some molecules down here doing vibrational or rotational transitions, but nothing in the middle. That's, that's kind of the reason here. And in the microwave, in the microwave oven, what are the kind of transitions? I, 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 think, I think a microwave oven is this big, and I think it has a few wavelengths within that, I think, within that shape. So I guess some, some centimeters. It should be a rotational transition. Uh, yeah, 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 okay, no, that's a good question. The problem with that is that if you have, I mean, the, the, this, the, the, these are all molecules in the gas phase. If you have a molecule in your food, food phase, then its, its rotation is in, in, inhibited by 
the other molecules. So it's, it's more of a, yeah, some other kind of vibrational. It's a good, another good question. Okay, so this final graph, so this shows you that these different kinds of rotate, molecular motion are associated with different parts of the wavelength spectrum and are therefore associated with different telescopes. We knew this was ALMA, this, this side of the curve, the microwave, radio. So ALMA's looking at rotational transitions of molecules. The space telescopes, Spitzer and the uh, Herschel, that I showed a picture of one, are looking at vibrational motion. And the ground-based telescopes and the aeroplane, Sophia is kind of on the border, and the space telescopes on this end are looking at electronic motion. So there are three kinds of molecular motion, three different ways. Now. Okay, um, maybe this is better as reference. <laughs> Because when you start combining fields, becoming interdisciplinary, combining physics to do with photons scattering, combining chemistry to do with bonds forming, combining spectroscopy to, to do with these kind of rotational vibrational motions, you end up with all kinds of ways to describe the energy. But they're all exactly the same. I mean, I already said electron volts is my favorite because it has a simple physical meaning. Um, this I won't use, it's only used in theoretical calculations, but I like it because the atomic unit is a very, small amount of energy, and it has the unit of AU. So if you're ever studying theoretical chemistry in the context of the solar system, be really careful with your units, or you might end up 45 orders of magnitude wrong. That's a warning. Um, <clears throat> and, but there's kind of a, let's look at these a little bit, because I'm going to show some graphs of results. And they use all these different units, because in the microwave, people tend to use gigahertz, because microwave is such a, long wavelength that has, has a small frequency, so it's meaningful to talk about hertz. I mean, a billion hertz is a lot, but an ultraviolet photon has many, many more hertz, so it's a useless unit. So the gigahertz is used, the wavelength. This is most often used in the uh, vibrational, sorry, the, the visible and the ultraviolet region because the wavelengths you're talking about are about 100, it's a convenient number, nanometers. But it's the same thing, just with a formula to convert it. Wave numbers is ones used in laboratory spectroscopy, and it's just basically one over the wavelength. So that's, that's kind of an easy transition to make. Although not in nanometers, but centimeters. Okay. Uh, the temperature units, this, this, is, this, is, this is the one that's really interesting when you start doing actual chemical uh, reactions. Because, I mean, the temperature is not an energy, but the Boltzmann's constant just relates energy and temperature by a constant factor. And what it means is that you can roughly say, if you have one EV, that is, that photon is 1 eV, that would be a vibrational, vibrational emission, then that corresponds to a temperature of about 11,000 Kelvin, meaning a black body, the black body star, 11,000 Kelvin star, will emit a lot of photons of about 1 eV. I mean, more and less as well, but that's giving you a, a gauge of photon energy versus temperature. So that's actually, ten, that tends to be useful. Uh, in pure chemistry, they're like kilojoules per mole, or kilocalories per mole, so there's that. Where a mole is a Avogadro's number, uh, atoms, molecules, particles. Yeah, so visible, we'll use nanometer. Infrared, they use m microns, sometimes wave numbers, inverse centimeters. And the uh, microwave, they use gigahertz. Uh, in the nature, uh, which point uh, that more uh, In the nature, uh, which one is the more binded, uh, energetic, energetically binded molecule? and which one is the wavelength associated to that molecule? The most, the most bound molecule? Yeah. Oh, good question. The N N2 is the most bound one I can think of. Um, and by, yeah, okay. Um, so what, what you're asking, I think, is a good way to say it, is that if, if, you, if you have a molecule in its ground state, so this, this is one, in its ground vibrational state and rotational state, so really down here, then the amount of energy you need to unbind the molecule, to dissociate it, to break it apart, you need to get to this point. Right, because at this point, effectively what's happening is, this is the same curve, distance between the nuclei versus potential energy. So here they're at their perfect minimum. 
here they're very close together. And then the, the nuclei start to feel their positive repulsion, so the energy is, goes up. Over here, are so far apart that moving further apart makes no difference. That's why it goes flat. And so the energy to, to unbind is exactly this point to this point. And so the question is, how strongly related are all the charges to make this curve deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper? And N2 is the one I, I as far as I know, is the deepest. Because as soon as you start having many, many uh, nuclei, more than two, three or four nuclei, then you, get, then you, you always have, a, have an easy way out. There's going to be a, uh, an edge to this in one of the phase, one of the phase space of all the nuclear motions that you have. And because of its triple bond, that gives you this deeper energy. Nice. Yes. Is the energy cure enough to classify a molecule as an insulator or a conductor or a semiconductor, given the fact that this uh, property has to do with the movement of electrons? Okay. Um, so, I, as far as I know, the conductor-semiconductor idea is related to a crystal or a, a, a solid-state medium, right, where you have this... You don't think of a molecule as necessarily being, correct me if I'm wrong, a molecule as being a discrete small number of, of nuclei bound together, but an infinite series of nuclei all bound together giving you a uh, electron motion between them. In this case, to conduct molecules in the gas phase, which is kind of what this is, really the gas phase, I guess you have the kind of process, which can happen, If you, for example, had a hydrogen atom, and it was in fact a hydrogen ion, the electron was gone, just a bare proton, and that collides with a hydrogen molecule, then one of the electrons from the molecule can move to the atom. And, and that's kind of con conducting electricity. But the, in, in, in general, because the electrons are not really free to move from molecule to molecule, and in any case, the molecules themselves are free to move because they're in the gas phase. Maybe conduction is a, an unusual concept. I find that an error. Yes, so on this, this first, one? Yes, yes. No, no, in the, yes, here. So I'm, I deserve a, okay. a prize. Uh, well, you, you might. Well, yes. We don't know if you're right yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is, is electron ball is electron ball per, per particle, right? Because it's just a unit of energy. I mean, hypothetically, one electron is a good conceptual picture, but it could be anything, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. but, but uh, yes, Kil kilojoule per mole is um, something like an energy density um, unit or something like that. It's, it's still just energy. But the, the, the idea is, is that um, if you have the reverse process of before, say two atoms come together, fall down, and so they're not unbound, they bond, then as they fall down, they'll release some energy. That's an exothermic reaction, releases some energy. And so one formation of a molecule will release a tiny amount of energy, like an EV, which is impressive, but a tiny amount of energy. However, you know, 10 to this 23 atoms re releases a, a amount of energy you can actually, in a test tube, measure. And so, I, and I believe even when they invented this unit, they didn't know what Avogadro's number was. So, like, like the Jensky, they just said, they defined a standard somewhere in France, probably, and then that was the reason. So, it's still just energy. Yeah. Could you give me some number with this unit? For example, I don't know, the reaction energy of oxygen with wood or something in, in kilojoules per, per mole? <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Um, Order of magnitude, 100 kilojoules I mean, per uh, a, a, a chemical bonding can be 50 or 100. That's pretty common. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one, one EV is kind of one of the vibrational levels. And I, okay, well, 100 is one EV, so a few vibrations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so in space again. So the picture of the solar absorption. Yeah, I don't, maybe, is it time for a break, is it? No? Well, you, you just stop me because uh, I'll go on. Yeah. I, I, I stopped you? No, no, no. 
you stop me when it's time for a break. Yeah. Um, so exactly exa like the, the absorption in the sun, if you look at distant objects through diffuse clouds, you see the same absorption picture. And this actually is the first detection of molecules. So if we begin in the beginning of time, looking at distant stars through the diffuse interstellar medium, then you see absorption lines uh, throughout the visible. So these are electronic transitions. Even a bit, this is, this is there's no scale, sorry, but this is clearly visible. This is infrared on the side. So even in the near infrared, you also see absorption lines. And to this day, this is the first detection of what must be molecules. No idea. No one knows what they are. This is the, big, the, the first the beginning of astrochemistry, and maybe it'll be the end. We don't know. All of them. All of them. The, 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 this is a synthetic spectrum showing all, all of these bands. The, they're called the diffuse interstellar bands, the name of these unknown lines. And uh, yeah, there's been decades of work to figure that one out. No one's figured it out. And the reason, I, I think you could say, is because in the laboratory, you have test tubes and vacuum chambers. But n none of these are as big as space. None of them have, have as low density as space does. In the laboratory, you just can't achieve that kind of density. So these kind of molecules might be, that they're apparently really common in space, whatever they are. Everywhere you look, you see them. But they're just completely uncommon on Earth, maybe even impossible to exist on Earth. That's why we don't know what they are, I think. Um, if you zoom in, then you see one of these lines. And you see it even has not just one line, but it has some structure. That's, that's a good sign of a molecule, or at least of a, uh, a radical with some kind of um, fine structure in terms of it's, it's, it's not actually a completely stable species, but un, 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 unidentified and invisible. That's interesting. So then if you look at the first, yes. Same. There's no theory for those those kind of conditions. Yeah, well, yeah. So, the, so yeah. I mean, yeah. There are theories. Um, the the general picture is that there's, I mean, the conditions. These conditions are diffuse, so there's no, well, not many collisions to form new bonds, and they're irradiated. Then they're kind of not in a dense cloud, so there's UV radiation. So whatever molecule it is, must be very good at surviving in a UV environment, meaning. This energy has to be really high, like you said. Or alternatively, it has, to be a, um, it has to be a very large molecule, so it can be excited. And then rather than dissociate, it so vibrates so much that it loses the energy over time, rather than breaking apart. So, that's, so what, what that both suggests is that these are large carbon molecules. So uh, probably not long carbon chains, but if you have like a graphite sheet, for example, that's a very large molecule. And it could, could have these survivability parameters you need. And it could have the right spectrum. But there's so many possible carbon sheets, shapes, one or more less carbon, a few more on the side, whatever, that nobody knows which one this might be. So that, that's probably the leading theory, is, is big pieces of carbon of unknown identity. Yeah. Like I say, we'll. Uh, um, OK, so that was 1922, the first molecules in space. Not that graph, but uh, the same thing. And then in the 30s and 40s, they detected molecules. And this time, they, they could actually identify them. So what we're looking at here is you're looking through, um, whatever. This, this is looking not, not rho Ophiuchus, zeta Ophiuchus, so a different star in the constellation, but also looking through the same uh, interstellar cloud, because there's a big interstellar cloud over many parsecs with the stars behind it. So you can see through, through that. And so this line, this is the absorption spectrum. This line is actually one of the lines from the star itself. And you know that because it's so broad. I mean, the stellar absorption lines are quite fat like that because of the high temperatures. There's a lot of Doppler broadening in the photosphere of the star. But then there's weak lines on top of that. And so those, because they're so narrow, can't be from the star, must be from this cloud in the front. And so those could be identified with these two, two particular diatomic simple molecules which have absorption into their electronic states in the visible. So that was the real beginning of astrochemistry. And that's an excellent place to stop for a break. Um, yeah. So how much time do you want to stop? Do you think it's 15 minutes? F 15 is fine hour, for me, yeah. Hour, yeah, 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 15. 15 if, if, if whatever you think is best, that's fine. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if we'll get to the end, to be honest. <laughs> it depends on the we, question, though. Yeah, yeah, but we, 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 can, we can start it again tomorrow, though. That's, that's fine. No, no, no. Yeah.
Yep. Yeah, no, no, um, yep. So, 50 minutes. Yep.